Richard Branson, the man with the golden touch and the billionaire smile. He's fabulously rich, famous as a rock star, and he always seems to be having a really good time. I've been extraordinarily fortunate. I've enjoyed every minute of my life. So I wouldn't swap my life with anybody. He's not impressed by wealth. He's more bothered about, do I have fun and do I have excitement? You, you've got to have the buzz. Branson parlayed a sexy name, Virgin, into branding gold. An astounding 300 plus goods and services, from rock to air travel to cell phones to trains. We have taken on the big, fat, bloated companies that have not really thought too much about the consumer. And we've gone in and shaken them up. If you'd analyzed the risks that Richard was taking, you wouldn't take them because no risk analysis would say, go ahead with this. To keep it all afloat, Branson became his own best pitch man, living out the virgin values of adventure and fun, even if it meant putting his own life on the line. I do seem to have conceived almost every way known to man to, to try to kill myself, and I've been very fortunate to be here today to talk about some of these stories. If such a title actually existed, Richard Branson might really be the most interesting man in the world. He owns his own island, balloons around the globe, works with world leaders, and he plans to take a virgin submarine to the uncharted bottom of the ocean floor. His riskiest adventure yet. You only live once, and we accept that there are risks attached to doing something that mankind hasn't done before, but we, we, go, we go there with our eyes open. Branson has spent much of his life on the high wire of entrepreneurial risk. He has amassed a personal fortune of more than four billion dollars. Can't be bad. <laughs> I've never been interested in uh, making money. I mean, it's um, easy to say, I suppose, people might say when you have made money, but I, I've, I've just been interested in creating things and creating things that I could be proud of and, um, and you know, having a lot of fun creating things. Richard Charles Nicholas Branson was born on July 18, 1950 to middle-class parents on the outskirts of London. His father was a barrister. His mother was a former flight attendant. Severely dyslexic, he could barely read by the age of eight and was hopelessly lost with numbers. School was painful. You know, I'd look at, look at a blackboard and wouldn't be able to understand anything that was going on. Interestingly, if you look at the history of dyslexics, they, they often uh, exceed quite exceptionally because they concentrate on the areas that, they, that they're good at. It certainly taught me the art of delegation <laughs> from a quite a young age. Nick Powell was Branson's closest friend and future business partner. I always thought with Richard that he was going to make an impact on the world. You could tell from a relatively early age that he had qualities that uh, were not common amongst all the other friends that, that we had. We used to play dare, sitting on either side of the white line, and it was the last one to move when the car came down the road. Richard always won the games of dare. But Branson had a strong entrepreneurial streak. When he was 13, he tried growing Christmas trees for sale. He tried breeding parakeets. At 15, he decided to launch a national student newspaper. I worked out of a phone box at my school, ringing up Coca-Cola, ringing up you know, people to try to write for the magazine, ringing up Barclays Bank to try to get them to advertise. You know, there'd be queues of people outside the phone box as I was shoving more money into the, into the phone. The magazine Student was an instant hit with a circulation of 50,000. Graham Boynton reports on the travel industry for the London Telegraph and has been covering Branson since the 1980s. Although he was a child of the 60s, he was always slightly awkward. So I think what happened was the business gave him a vocabulary, a, a raison d'etre, and, 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 he, and he went from there. In 1970, Branson started a mail-order discount record company that he hoped would raise money for the magazine. The first order of business was coming up with a name. Somebody suggested slip disc records. Uh, we had the, you know, the old vinyl di disc which kept on slipping. Um, somebody else laughed, you know, why not virgin? Uh, we're all virgins and hysterical laughter all, all around. Um, and, and I suddenly thought, I, I am virgin at business. Um, I, you know, I might be virgin at other things as well. And, you know, why not virgin? A postal strike in 1971 nearly deflowered the mail order record business. 
So Branson decided to open a record store, one with headphones and water pillows that catered to a younger generation. Simon Draper, Branson's cousin, was his first record buyer and the future head of Virgin Records. Everyone was paid the same. So this, there was just a kind of a feeling that, that no one should be earning any more money than anyone else. But if you stop to think about it, it was actually convenient to have everyone paid the same because it could pay everyone less. Some of the people who worked for Richard in the record shops in, in, in uh, Notting Hill, they, they used to steal the records out of the shops. And they were absolutely amazed when Richard fired them for, for, for stealing. He was wired to be a businessman from, from day one. Five months after opening the Virgin store, Branson was suddenly arrested for tax evasion. He was discounting his records in part because he had figured out a way to get around a 33% record tax. He spent a night in jail, and his parents had to put up their home to get him out. He thought that the part of get, you know, life's game was to avoid paying tax. And I think that must have come as a huge shock to Richard. He was extremely upset. But he behaved impeccably. He carried the can, so no one else uh, had any penalties. I had managed to avoid a criminal offence uh, by paying what, what the customs and excise needed. And we expanded our record shops very quickly so we could get the turnover in order to pay, you know, pay off the debt. Since then, I've made sure that we've done everything ethically and you know, without, without worry that someone's going to come knocking on our door. To pay off a $150,000 fine and avoid going to court and possibly prison, Branson rolled the dice on some new ventures, including a recording studio and a new record label, which he launched with his cousin, Simon Draper. Their first signing was an unknown folky named Mike Oldfield with an odd instrumental album called Tubular Bells. We're asking each other to take a punt at what we thought it was going to sell. And I seem to think that I thought it would sell 20,000 copies which seemed a lot to me <laughs> at the time. But millions later, you know, it's a very different story. 16 million, to be precise. Overnight, the record put Virgin on the map and made Richard Branson, not yet 23, a millionaire. Branson poured his profits into new artists and ventures, but his willingness to reinvest all his winnings unnerved his partners. Nick Powell put up so much resistance that Branson bought him out. I didn't believe we had enough cash flow to sustain the expansion of the company. And I was wrong. I'm willing to double down maybe more than I recommend to other people. <laughs> but there have been occasions where I've got my wife to sign this bit of paper and she hasn't realized that the house has been put on, on the line for the next business venture. By 1984, Richard Branson was living the life of a rock and roll kingpin. He owned this island in, what else, the British Virgin Islands. And Virgin Records was one of the most successful independent labels in the world. The Sex Pistols, Simple Minds, Human League, Culture Club were all million selling acts. Branson was flush with cash and looking for ways to spend it. Out of the blue, an insurance lawyer named Randolph Fields called and asked Branson to back him on a transatlantic airline. Simon Draper you know, and, and my other poor partners would be tearing their hair out because, uh, you know, suddenly, you know, I was saying, you know, I hate traveling on other people's airlines and we can do it better. My shares, um, which I owned at that time 15% of the whole Virgin Group, um, were becoming pretty valuable. So I was appalled and I said, this is the beginning of the end of our relationship. Branson launched his airline with a single used 747 that he leased from Boeing. The guy from Boeing said, um, you know, what did you say the name of your company was? I said, well, Virgin, um, you know, we're the people who brought you the Sex Pistols, the Rolling Stones. He, he just slightly jokingly said, well, you know, with a name like that, you know, we hope your airline will go the whole way um, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. After buying Fields out of the partnership, Branson decided to offer an upgraded mix of economy and business class fares, with a big emphasis on non-stop fun. 
Virgin's inaugural flight from London to New York set the tone. Let me tell you, it was a bacchanalian orgy. I mean, it was wild, there was drinking, there were topless models on the plane. It was out of a party and Richard led from the front. David Tate, the first person Branson hired, was an executive with Virgin Atlantic. When the door to the airplane opened at Newark, it was kind of like a champagne cork coming out of a bottle because to this day I think there was still a, a record number of champagne bottles drunk on that flight over. With just one plane and one route, Branson's first problem was promotion. He didn't have the advertising budget to compete with British Airways and the other giant carriers. So he took matters into his own hands, embarking on a series of breathless ballooning and boating adventures that would quickly turn Virgin Airlines into a household name. Good, uh, beginning of a great adventure. His 1987 flight across the Atlantic fascinated world media for weeks. Five people had died in earlier attempts. Per Lindstrand was Branson's co-pilot. He would entirely put his life into my hands, and um, I must say he's had scouts. As they eased the balloon into the Irish Sea, fierce winds tossed them against the waves. My fellow balloonists and the more experienced balloonists jumped, jumped out of the balloon. I was left in this balloon on my own, and the balloon spiraled up to you know, 10, 15,000 feet. I'm in the water. Rich is in the balloon. He doesn't really know how it works. That was the scariest moment in my life, for sure. Branson managed to lower the balloon and jumped into the freezing water. A Royal Air Force helicopter fished him out, along with Pear, who nearly died after swimming in place for two hours. I used to like to describe Richard as a cross between Evil Knievel and Ted Turner. He'll always tell you that I'm ballooning because it's great publicity for the company. Baloney. He's doing it because he enjoys it. If he were a cat, he'd be on his third set of nine lives. By the end of 1989, Richard Branson's world was expanding on all fronts. He married his longtime partner, Joan Templeman, in a ceremony on Necker Island. The couple already had two kids, four-year-old Sam and eight-year-old Holly. The company was also branching out. Branson had taken the Virgin Group public in 1986 with an IPO that generated more than $56 million. I don't think going public will make that big a difference um, to the way we conduct our business. That turned out to be wrong. It did make a difference. Branson chafed at being accountable to an outside board and bought back Virgin after two years. He now presided over a small but precarious empire with a growing airline that was in constant danger of going under. And worse, British Airways was determined to crush its upstart rival. The rivalry between British Airways and Virgin Atlantic has always puzzled me. I think it was down to British establishment seeing this young upstart with long hair, sort of reckless, motor mouse, airline entrepreneur, and it really cheesed them off. So much so that in 1991, British Airways launched what the press called the Dirty Tricks campaign. They had teams of people, you know, behind closed doors, illegally accessing our computer information, ringing our passengers, pretending to be from Virgin Atlantic, saying we had, you know, flights that were cancelled and switching them on to British Airways. They had people going through my rubbish bins, going through the rubbish bins of our clubs, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, pick up. Uh, any, any kind of dirt on us. You know, they were placing stories in the press and so on and so on. Most damagingly, Branson was convinced that British Airways was stoking rumors that Virgin was insolvent and about to go under. Will Whitehorn is the former head of Virgin Galactic and has worked closely with Branson since 1987. Every day you take off, if you've got empty seats, you've lost money. So if somebody can persuade passengers not to book with a certain airline because they think it's going to go bust, it will go bust. Branson was fighting to keep Virgin Atlantic alive, and once again, he put his life on the line to do it. He took off on another dangerous promotional balloon trip, this one over the Pacific. Watch your ears. Uh, it's pressurizing. Uh, this is pressurizing now. We've got to watch our ears. 
in the middle of the Pacific, we lost two full fuel tanks. And we didn't know we had enough fuel to make it. Do we have any chance? We knew that we had to fly this balloon at an average speed of over 180 miles an hour, and that was just blown by the wind, and so the, the, the chances of that happening were extraordinarily unlikely. But we got right into the core of the jet stream and suddenly saw the speedometer going you know, 150, 160, 170, 180, 190, 200, 210, 220. I'm not a religious person, but it was as if somebody up there had just taken that balloon and was just pushing it, pushing it through the jet stream. Branson and Lindstrand crash-landed on a frozen lake 300 miles from the nearest habitation. We missed where we were aiming for by um, 3,500 miles and landed in the Arctic in a snowstorm at minus 60 degrees, but we couldn't have been happier. In fact, by the time Branson thawed out, he was a superstar. His record label was heating up too. Virgin Records signed Janet Jackson and the Rolling Stones to multi-year deals. But in the short term, it was irrelevant. British Airways' Dirty Tricks campaign against Virgin Atlantic was making it impossible to get credit. To save the airline, Branson had to make the toughest call of his life. He decided to sell his beloved record company. Penny Pike served as his personal assistant for 31 years. Everyone was terribly shocked. I mean, Richard was more shocked than most people, but he cried and cried and cried. It was a bit like selling a child. I told the staff, burst into tears, ran, you know, ran down back towards my house with tears streaming down my face. He passed this sign that said, Branson sells for a billion dollars. And I realised life wasn't, wasn't that bad. He secured the future of Virgin Atlantic because he had enough capital behind him after that to be able to look any competitor in the face and say, well, you know, I can, I, you know, I can sit this out as long as you can. People said at the time we were mad to, you know, sell the record company to put the money into an airline. As it turns out, of course, the record industry has collapsed and uh, the airline industry hasn't done too badly for us. One month after the billion dollar label deal, Branson sued British Airways for libel. The airline settled out of court and paid Branson a record $1.1 million. We won the biggest libel damages of any libel case, um, and you know they had to make a public apology. <laughs> Who's flying on Virgin? <laughs> oh, Richard Branson was elated. That day was probably one of the great days of his business career. He'd done it. <laughs> he'd, he'd stomped on the mighty British Airways. That night, he was on the phone to various people, and he had this real determination in his voice that this was the moment you know that he was going to make version atlantic a global success and he was going to take this company and grow it around the world after selling virgin records for a billion dollars in 1992 richard branson was ready to exploit his most valuable asset the virgin brand we suddenly realized, you know, we actually have, you know, something which is something we've got to protect and we've got to nurture. The brand is ultimately is what, what Virgin's all about. Branson was the brand and he tirelessly promoted it. To date, he has virginized over 300 products and services. I think generally if you can create something you can be proud of, uh, it's likely to be successful. I wasn't thinking, right, let's just take this brand into lots of different areas. I just felt, you know, we can, we, can, we can do better in health clubs, we can do better in mobile phone business. Some ventures, like Virgin Brides and Virgin Cola, fizzled quickly. Then the brand stumbled with Virgin Trains. The acquisition came with a dilapidated infrastructure, and it took years to get the trains to run on time. But some endeavors have been breathtaking in their success. In 1999, Branson struck pay dirt. He partnered with service providers to launch Virgin Mobile. They supplied the network. He supplied the marketing and name and the innovative idea of letting customers pay as they go. Bernd Schmidt, 
A professor at Columbia University's School of Business is an expert in branding. The value of a brand is really in the intangibles because customers uh, are not just buying products. They're not just buying functionality. They're also buying an image. They're buying a lifestyle. They're buying an experience. He stands for certain things. He stands for service, for customer experience, for innovation, for fun. Branson was now business royalty and was honored in 1999 by his country's royalty. He was knighted by the Queen as a millennium icon for his contribution to commerce. Becoming Sir Richard did nothing to slow him down. Five years later, he took Virgin Mobile public with an IPO that he said valued the company at $1.5 billion. Branson made each of his new ventures an independent company so that no single failure could bring the empire down. Nevertheless, analysts have regularly questioned the value of the Virgin Group, which is still privately held. The headlines would be, you know, when's Branson's balloon going to burst? Um, and every time we started something new, you know, he's stretching the brand too thin. And, uh, and sometimes they went far off the truth. The Virgin Group continued to spin off new ventures. And in 2004, Branson announced one of his most imaginative. He was going to take people into outer space, beginning with his own mother. I think we're within about 18 months um, of going up into space and then starting a whole new era of commercial spaceship travel. Hopefully hundreds if not thousands of people will be able to have the, ch the chance to become astronauts and go into space. It's a huge risk. Uh, it's rather like putting your name, uh, your brand on a Formula One race car. It's great when it's winning, but if it ends up wrapped around a concrete pole somewhere, then, then it has a lot of downside. Branson stretched the Virgin brand even farther in 2006. With his own airline spewing tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, he pledged to spend all profits from his transportation companies over the next 10 years, an estimated $3 billion, to fund research for an eco-friendly biofuel. He also launched the Council of Elders, a crisis intervention dream team led by Nelson Mandela. I'd reached the age of 55. I'd made um, uh, good money. So I could pick up the phone to pretty well anybody and cut through and get things done. Suddenly I was in a position where I could maybe make a difference in the world. Critics have scoffed at the new socially minded Branson and point to the offshore tax shelters he has used for decades to protect his wealth. I don't think Richard's any different to the other very, very wealthy businessmen who've got armies of accountants and lawyers telling them, you know, where to put their money, where to hide their money. Is he the people's entrepreneur only up to a point? Branson hasn't been able to safeguard all of his assets. Virgin America had a rough time getting off the ground and lost nearly $400 million before beginning to turn a profit in the third quarter of 2010. And escalating fuel costs have prompted Branson to hire a German bank to assess the value of Virgin Atlantic as a first step towards selling a portion of his shares. As he heads into his 60s, it's been a long and thrilling journey for the Virgin King. Branson's made his own luck. I think he's been very, very good at it. So it's not just a golden touch. I think he's worked for it. Of course he's driven by money, but he's not impressed by wealth. He's more bothered about do I have fun and do I have excitement? He, you've got to have the balance. I've been extraordinarily fortunate. I've enjoyed every minute of my life. Going forward, most of my time will be spent on setting up not-for-profit enterprises and seeing them you know, tackling some of the big, the big problems in the world. Um, but at the same time, you know, we will still have wonderful adventures, go, go to space, go to the bottom of the oceans, and uh, still push ourselves and challenge my children and challenge the people around me and, and have a blast.